he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And what is it that we preached? Verse 12, Christ is preached that He has been raised from the dead. So how do some among you say? There is no resurrection of the dead. In this great chapter, which runs 58 verses long, Paul will defend, define, describe, and delight in the resurrection. That's where his testimony starts, by saying this, I really, I really don't understand how you can have questions about bodily resurrection when I preach to you the gospel, which is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and was raised on the third day, and you believed that, and when your faith was genuine, you continue to stand in that. You are saved by that. You are the first line of evidence for the validity of the resurrection, your existence, your very existence. He says actually in the Greek, I gospelized you, and you received it, and you stand in it, perfect tense, past going forward. You are in a permanent state of having received and believed the gospel. You cannot now deny bodily resurrection because that's necessary in the gospel. If Christ is raised, then there is a resurrection. He as man was raised, and we as redeemed humanity will be raised. Let's go back to the basics is what he's saying. Let's start at the very beginning. You heard the gospel, you believed the gospel, you stand in the gospel, you hold fast the Word, you persevere in this truth, and it's predicated on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus rose from the dead, then there is a bodily resurrection. There is a bodily resurrection. That's where it all starts. Having established that, he'll take a closer look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and then make the connection between that and the resurrection of believers. Kenneth Latourette, historian, said it was the conviction of the resurrection of Jesus which lifted His followers out of the despair into which His death had cast them and which led to the perpetuation of the movement begun by Him. But for their profound belief that the crucified had risen from the dead and that they had seen Him and talked with Him, the death of Jesus and even Jesus Himself would probably have been all but forgotten. So he is saying, how can you question the resurrection when you're the proof of resurrection? The church holding fast to a living Christ has affirmed His resurrection and in Him the promise of their own resurrection. Next week on Grace to You. Christianity is a revelation of God's intention to raise everyone eternal. Your future as a believer is to be raised to have a body like the body of the risen Christ. If you do not believe in the resurrection, your faith is vain. Five things. And God wants to take those five things that you wrote from, I think, when you get me, I think you get one, two, three, four, five. Later, when you get me, I believe you get one, two, 
three, four, five. Still more mature? When you get me, I know you will get one, two, three, four, five. I think, I believe, I know. Do you know what you have been given? Having made known unto us the mystery, oh God, the mystery of his will. Sometimes the hardest thing in the world for me to see is me. If you were in the room right now, I could see you. I can see the room. I can see the lights. I can see my computer. I can see everything around me. The thing I have the trouble seeing is me. Because eyes don't float backwards. They float forward. So I can see you easier than I can see me. But this time, we're going to flip the eyes around. Close your eyes. And we're going to see you. You spend way too much time seeing other people and what they got. And way too much time spend, spending your life seeing what you didn't get. I don't want you to waste another parcel of energy on what you didn't get and what you don't have. I'm asking you to have the courage to flip your eyes around and see what you have been given. Because as, as I see what has been given to me, I get some sense of what I am supposed to do. If I, if I go in the kitchen and I, and, 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 and I see flour and I see butter and, and I see ice water and, and I see, and I, and, but I don't see any eggs and I don't see any milk, so I know I'm not supposed to be making a cake because there's no eggs and there's no milk. I haven't been given that. But what could I take with the flour and the ice water and the butter? I could, I could, let me see. I could make pie crust. Mm -hmm. I could do that. How do you know you can make a pie crust? Because I know what's in it. And I have, I think I have. Let me go look. Because I believe, I believe I do. Then I go look, I say, I know I can do that. Going through what you have been given gives you clues to the mystery of his will. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. I hope you're getting something out of this. Let's, let's rehearse it. Let's see. Let's rehearse it. I think, I believe, I know. In between believe and know is declassification. I know. How do you know? He made known. He made known unto me the mystery of his will. Come on. We're going to do a couple more verses. That in the dispensations of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Who God thinks big. I thought he was trying to connect me to my church or to the choir or to the Will and the Fried Chicken Committee or the Cake Baking Society. No, no. He's trying to connect me to the whole thing, the whole things of, of, of things in heaven and in earth. I am a part of something so much bigger than me, bigger than my era, bigger than my times, bigger than my language, 
bigger than my ethnicity, bigger than my country, bigger than my denomination, bigger than my affiliations. He has brought me into this large things of that which is and was and is to come, that which is eternal, that which is physical. He has brought me into the realm of something that is humongous. Have you ever praised God till you felt like you weren't alone? Have you ever started worshiping God till you felt like you were worshiping in the presence of angels? When you get in the spirit, you come into the presence of something bigger than yourself, and God ties you in to things in earth and things in heaven. He ties you in. He connects you. He connects you. He brings you in to something so much bigger, to the spirits of just man made perfect. <laughs> He brought you into something, baby. You don't know. You think you're just watching YouTube. You think you're just watching Facebook. You think you're just going to Wednesday Night Bible. You have no idea. He has brought you into something that is bigger than your clock, that's bigger than your birthdays, that's bigger than time itself. He has brought you into an eternal strategy, a role you are to play. A role that only you can play. He has brought you into it. And it doesn't matter whether people think it's great or not. It could be as small as the woman that was making beds at Naaman's house. And all of a sudden while she was making beds, a little maid turned and told him, I would to God that you would go to Israel. There he is, a prophet in Israel. And because of that woman telling him that, Naaman's leprosy was cleansed. God used a maid. Go to the next village, and there you will find a colt tied to a post. God used a colt. He knew where the colt was. He used a maid. He used two fish and five loaves of bread. He used with Samson the jawbone of an ass. With the children of Israel, he used a rock that Moses smote and water came out. Don't you tell me God can't use you. Don't you tell me that God doesn't have a plan. If he planned the rock and he planned the jawbone of an ass, that it would be right there, that it would die right there, that it would dry up right there, so that when Samson came by and he was fighting the Philistines, he said, I need the jawbone to be right there because I'm going to use that to bring out every little thing about you.